All right, so we will be looking at the 11th book of the New Testament, uh, the book to Philippi. Let's start this morning with a prayer. Our Father, we are thankful for every blessing that you give to us in abundance. Father, we're mindful of the spiritual blessings, but we're also mindful of the physical blessings. Father, we pray that you will bless us, that we may not take these things for granted, but that we may always use them as good stewards. If you've given to us the things to care for a while, but they should be used in your service. Father, we pray that you'll bless our time together as we consider the book of Philippians. Father, we know there are so many good truths that are there. Father, we pray that you will bless each one that is here, each one that is watching online. Father, bless our homes, bless our families. Father, help us ever seek to draw closer to you, to pattern our lives after the life of Jesus Christ. Father, bless our time together this morning as we come before your throne in worship. Father, go with us, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. So we think about the book of Philippians. Uh, we, this is a very personal letter uh, that Paul writes to the church in Philippi. Um, and always you hear, well, that's the epistle of joy. And it is the epistle of joy. So many times uh, we see joy or rejoice come up. And I don't know if we can see this here. It doesn't look too bad. I I, I couldn't get it all on one slide. So, Michael, what I did, I put it in Word and I took a picture of it. And I put the picture up there. (laughs) There's always a way around things. Uh, But Paul, in just this one epistle, he prays with joy, he rejoices that Christ is proclaimed, he will remain living on the earth for the Philippians, joy in the faith. He asks the Philippians to complete his joy. He's glad and he rejoices with the Philippians. He sends Epaphroditus that the Philippians might rejoice. He tells the Philippians to receive Epaphroditus with joy. He tells the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord. He tells them they are his joy. He tells them two times in the same verse to rejoice in the Lord. And he rejoiced in the Lord at the Philippians' concern for him. All the while, Paul is in prison. Paul is chained to a guard. Uh, But yet, (laughs) he is focused on joy. That's just crazy. (laughs) Who does that? How would you feel if you are imprisoned falsely? Um, You know, we we get real indignant when we are falsely accused. Oh, I should not. You know, we get real indignant about that. And Paul has no reason to be imprisoned. And he is still focusing on joy. And he's encouraging joy in the people. So... The epistle makes evident the fact that joy and happiness are not at the mercy of external things. On my mind this week, and really the last couple of weeks, has been the people of Ukraine. There are Christians there. They sent missionaries over there. They established congregations. They're undergoing that mess over there. It's just a big mess. And You know, three weeks ago, they were living life normal, like you and I. And now, all of a sudden, they have to leave their home. They, you know, they've got people invading their country. I can't imagine. But somehow, they can still focus on joy. They can still think about these things. Um, You know, could I do that? I don't know. 
hard, hard to imagine. You know, you really never know what you can endure until you endure it. Why is that? I don't know. I would hope I would be able to hold up under that. Uh, I would hope I would still be strong. I would hope I would still have joy and contentment. Uh, but man, they, they're just having an awful time. And of course, we remember them in our prayers. Internal and external. So many times, you know, we get overwhelmed just by life. <laughs> you know, here in the United States, I tell people, you know, quit watching the news. The news <laughs> is bad. It's going to bring you down. Uh, people get fretting, that sort of thing. Man, I, I cut my news down to a minimum. There's been times I get real involved with it, and then there's times I backed off. And you know, <laughs> you do you do what you have to do to survive. Well, we can still rejoice no matter what is happening around us. And Paul encourages that. He exemplifies that. Rejoice. In the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. External, his situation was grim. He didn't know if he would live the day out every morning. Of course, none of us has any guarantees, do we? But his life was literally on the line. He was living at the whim of Nero, who was (laughs) cray-cray. He was evil. Uh, and we'll get back to him, but his life was lit. He was living at the whim of an evil man. And that's kind of how that went. Um, he modeled joy. And it wasn't just, you know, oblivious to what's going on. He talks about his union with Christ in this book. In chapter 3 and verse 8, he talks about communion with other Christians, other Christians in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He talks about the promise of the resurrection in 3, 10, 11, and then down in verse 20 and 21. These are things that give us joy. Union with Christ, communion with other Christians, and the promise of resurrection. We can be oblivious and turn a blind eye to a lot of things. These things are what sustain us. These are what give us hope. All right, that's the introduction. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> Let's look at a critical introduction. Authorship, just about everybody says it was Paul. Uh, nobody really argues about it, which is kind of unusual. Usually there's one guy saying, oh, it was some other guy. Um, the early church fathers, Polycarp, Arrhenius, talk about Paul as being the author. Some people talk about this being a composite letter. If you will, open your Bible to uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3 and 1. And you see it's a really dramatic break here. And he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to, to me and is safe for you. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> he switches gears. So you've got this dramatic shift here. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And you're kind of saying, where did that come from? All right? <laughs> and so some people want to say, well, this is a couple of letters from Paul that's been cobbled together. And this is where he starts in a different letter. Well, more likely, this is uh, one letter. He may have put it down for a while and come back to it. Uh, but it looks like in 3 and 1, it looks like he's getting ready to end the letter. But then he goes off on another another rant. So uh, 
you know, uh, more likely this is one letter. He may have, you know, put it down and picked it up. Um, the general consensus is that this is a, a one letter. Now, you have a shift of tone all the time. Uh, I do that when I'm writing a letter. Anybody ever write letters anymore? <laughs> uh, I have done it when I have written letters. Let's put it that way. I'm thinking about something, and then all of a sudden, oh, I wanted to talk about this. And uh, so that's, that's that. Now, go back to 1 and verse 1. So it's got Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. Does that mean Timothy is the co-author? Well, Timothy is there with him. Usually that's the case. Now, Timothy's not the only one with him. Or he might have been. You know, wait, wait and see. Um, and sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know. And I think sometimes there are people that's unnamed that are with Paul. Um, but does this mean, you know, the fact that he puts Paul and Timothy there, does that mean he's Timothy's co-author? It might also mean he is uh, Paul's emanuensis. There's your good word. That means Paul is dictating and Timothy's writing it down. Um, one of Paul's handicaps uh, possibly was his eyesight. Uh, and, you know, you remember one of the epistles, see, I'm, I'm signing this with my own hand because it's got large letters so I can see it. And, you know, that's possible. We don't know. Uh, was Timothy writing these things down? I don't know. It's kind of interesting to think about. Paul is still inspired, uh, and Timothy would just be the guy that wrote it down. Um, usually we'll say the, the date and place of writing. Uh, it's one of the prison epistles. So we got Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon are the prison epistles. They are letters written while in jail. All right. Where did he write it from? Usually we'll say Rome, and that's where I'd put my mark. Uh, other possibilities people have offered is Ephesus, Corinth, and Caesarea, um, where was Paul when he wrote this? Well, we know he was in prison. <laughs> we don't really know what town that prison was in. Uh, and you can, it's really fun, if you like this sort of thing, you take Acts and you know, the, the epistles, and you kind of mesh them together. How do they fit up? You know, a lot of the clues from questions we have over here in the epistles, we can find over the answers over in Acts. Uh, so he is near a praetorium, uh, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, Philippians 1.13 uh, says, Become known throughout the whole imperial guard. The, the word there is, is praetorium. Uh, and to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. He knows why he's there. All right? And he is telling people that is around him, that come to him, why he's there. Um, first, Second Corinthians 11, 23, uh, Paul's listing the things, you know, he was, his identity was being threatened, and he's having to defend himself. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far like greater labors, far more imprisonment, countless beatings, often near death. And he goes on and lists all the things he has suffered for Christ. And the implication is, what have these guys done? All right, but we want to focus far more imprisonment. So we know a couple of times Paul was in and where he was, but obviously we don't know all of them. So there is that. Uh, so probably the date, 61, 62, 63, somewhere in there. It's really hard to be precise. Uh, they didn't do dates like we do. Uh, they did it you know, during 
the reign of this guy is when this is happening. So you can kind of narrow it down, uh, but they didn't have a definite starting and ending date uh, like we have today. Um, let's look at the city of Philippi itself. And of course, we have to start with a map. Uh, he went to Philippi on the second missionary journey. If you remember, the, he was kind of going up through Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today. And the Lord says, nope, don't go over there. And nope, don't go over there. And he's kind of heading northwest up. And he ends up uh, at, what is it, Croaz? And that's when he gets the Macedonian call. Now, here's Philippi. Notice it is in the territory called Macedonia. Uh, so this is named after Philip of Macedon. And I'd heard about the Macedonian call, I guess, all my life. <laughs> Macedonian call, you know, that just comes up a lot. In, in church, but you hear about Philip of Macedon, and it took me until I was like uh, last week <laughs> to figure out Macedon and Macedonia. It's the same, and I don't know if you've ever made that connection, or maybe you did that a long time ago, uh, but I hadn't put those two things together. So it's the area is named after Philip of Macedon. What's important about him? Well, he's the father of Alexander the Great. And so he started the campaign, and when he died, Alexander the Great took over. So this is kind of a big area. This is a big deal. Uh, the Macedonians were, you know, they were north Greece, and of course the southern Greece guys, you know, they, those northern Greece guys are a little less sophisticated. They're a bunch of rubes, you know, that sort of thing. And but guess what? The northern Greece guys took over, and you know, of course, they <laughs> went crazy. Uh, then after that, and Alexander the Great, he influenced so many things, and you see his result of, of his life uh, even in the New Testament, hundreds of years after. And so, anyway, that's Philip. Philip of Macedon, and here we've got Philippi, uh, named after that guy. So that's a little bit of history about him. Probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> and you'll tell me, I'm, you're the only one interested in that stuff. So <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right. So here is Philippi again. He goes there again on the third missionary journey. So he's here with these people uh, two different times. So this is an area that was conquered by Rome in the second century BC. And it was made a Roman colony. So that's a big deal. Um, as a Roman colony, it was considered a miniature Rome. It was considered Rome over there. You know, kind of like an embassy is part of the home country. You know, you insult our injury, our embassy, you're insulting us. It, you know, that's, that's like their land, even though it's in another country. Well, this town was a Roman colony. And so that's going to be a big deal. Um, it had the dual purpose, really, of controlling the district that had been conquered by Rome and keeping retired soldiers out of Rome. Now think about this. Uh, there's pretty good logic going here. When Rome would conquer a territory, they would get a lot more soldiers because you can either join us or die. And so a lot of them opted, well, I think I will join you. <laughs> it's kind of how that worked. Uh, and so then they would join that army, and they might be sent anywhere. Well, 
if you retired from the army, they would give you land. And they're not going to give you land in Rome because we don't want that rabble around here. They will give you land in all these territories. And so, you know, you've got retired military guys. They're in town. They're going to keep things in line. So they were genius. <laughs> That's how Rome grew as they did, uh, expanding their territory and that sort of thing. Uh, so the idea of citizenship went along with that. And, you know, the advantage of being a Roman colony, you can vote, well, if you're a man, and if you own property. Uh, and then you can vote. Not everybody can vote. Uh, so it was still, you know, the idea of women voting. Women couldn't even testify in a court of law. That's just, you know, Christianity has really changed the status of women. Uh, and that's a whole different story. But, you know, it's lifted, lifted and honored women. Uh, not all of them. Of course, you can think of exceptions and we ought to. But, you know, the idea of women voting is just unthinkable. Uh, anyway, that's another thing. Uh, they were self-governing. They pretty much did, they were independent of the government of a province. So they were in a province of Macedonia. Thessalonica, that's hard to say, was the capital. But they kind of did their own thing. Uh, they were exempt from certain taxes. They had their own administration. They had their right of holding land in full ownership. But the idea of citizenship, that's a big deal. I am a citizen of Rome. Paul used that citizenship. He was from what town? Tarsus. And so as born there, he had the right of citizenship. And Paul was not afraid to use that card. Uh, hey, is it lawful? for you to be the man that is a Roman citizen. And they hear that, what do they do? They back off. And we read about that in Acts. So he wasn't afraid to use his rights. You know, some people, you know, they want complete separation of church and state. <laughs> Paul, Paul didn't think like that. Uh, he, he used his rights as a Roman citizen. And you remember his guard says, I paid big money to be a Roman citizen. How about you? Well, I was born that way. All right. Well, you know, we take citizenship for granted. Uh, but sometimes that's a really big deal. All right. Uh, and that's in Acts 22, 22 through 29, if you want to read about that. And just think about citizenship as you go through that. So a citizen could not be tortured, could not be beaten, could not be abused and without a trial. Now, women, slaves, uh, non-citizens, yeah, well, <laughs> no problem. You know, They literally believed that a slave could not tell the truth until after he'd been tortured. Uh, that was just the thinking. Today, you still have torture going on, but really the experts are saying, you know, you can really get the truth out without that. And, you know, they're still figuring that out. Now, Paul is going to say, you know what? You've got citizenship as Rome, but Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the people of Philippi were so proud of their heritage. They would dress as Romans. They would speak Latin. Uh, and, you know, here's Paul saying, you know what? You're real proud about that, but our citizenship as Christians is in heaven. All right. Philippi was a wealthy town. 
why? There was gold and silver mines uh, nearby. So that had an effect as well. Uh, let's look. Oh, that takes us back to, they were wealthy. That, that, that. Let's go down to the church in Philippi. There we go. So Paul established the church there uh, on his second missionary journey. And he worked there two times, Acts 16, 11, and then Acts 20, uh, verses 1 uh, and following. Uh, Paul had Luke, Timothy, and Silas with him. Well, how do we know Luke is there? He doesn't ever name Luke. But when you're reading in Acts, um, you read they did this, and then you read later on we did this. Uh, so he includes himself. So Luke starts with him at some point. He's going to switch over to us and our uh, pronouns. And then at another point, he's going to say they went here. So Luke, just by looking at that, we know Luke stayed here in Philippi uh, with this new congregation. That's where Paul uh, starts it. All right, we talked about the Macedonian call. Uh, he was in Troas at the time. Of course, he's working his way north, uh, northwest, going up through Asia Minor. And he ends up in Troas. And that's where he sees the vision of a man from Macedonia. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> imagine you are Paul going on there. And you're trying to figure out where to go to work for the Lord, where to establish a congregation, where to talk to people about Jesus. And Jesus says, nope, not, don't go there. Nope, don't go that way. And so he's, he's kind of like feeling his way in the dark uh, until he's in Troas. He gets a vision and he says, ah, now I know where to go. So going to Philippi, was the first time the gospel had been preached in Europe. And, and you know, before, even at this time, this is called Asia. Uh, so with the conversion there uh, of Lydia and the Philippian jailer, that's the nucleus there for a new congregation. Imagine you going into town. Now, Paul, usually, what did he do? He would go to the synagogue first. Why? Well. Mostly they believed in one God as opposed to the Romans, the, the Gentiles. So often they believed in so many gods. Um, you couldn't shake a stick without hitting a god, you know. Uh, it's kind of the way that worked. And you've got a group of people out praying at the river that believed in one God. That's where Paul finds it. All right. There was no synagogue there. So what does that tell us? There was no Jewish presence there. You had to have ten men uh, that were heads of family to establish a synagogue. So evidently there wasn't even enough Jewish people to make a synagogue. All right. Uh, imagine starting, you know, was Lydia Jewish? I don't, I don't really know was the Philippian jailer. Well, probably not. Um, but out by the river, uh, Lydia was a believer in one God. Now, whether it was the true God, uh, you know, there were Gentiles that were attracted to the idea of one God. And even those that didn't become proselytes uh, would still pray to this God. Cornelius is an example prayed to the one God. All right? and God heard his prayer. And God answered it. All right? So here is a businesswoman. She is a seller of purple. Purple dye was very expensive. It came from the shells of a certain critter. <laughs> I don't know. Crustacean? What is it? I don't know. Anyway, she would get the purple from those and dye expensive clothes. So she was probably pretty well off. 
she had a house big enough for Paul and his people, probably the early church met in her house. All right? Uh, so that's, you know, people that believed in one God, they were together there. That's who Paul focused on. Now, of course, the Philippian jailer, here is Paul. He's been, he's been beaten. Him, Paul and Silas are in jail. But what are they doing at midnight? They're singing hymns. You know, they're singing spiritual songs. And the Philippian jailer, of course, there's the, there's the earthquake. And you're familiar with that. Uh, you know, the jailer is ready to take his own life thinking they, they're escaping. And, buddy, you don't let your prisoner escape or we'll kill you. That, that's kind of how that works. Uh, well, he's ready to take his own life. And Paul says, no, wait, we're all here. Him and his household are converted. All right. Now, that's the nucleus of the church. Maybe that girl that had the demon, maybe she was in the church. We don't really know. What happened to that girl that you know, had the demon that was prophesying and uh, they cast the demon out? So that's the, that's the beginning of, of that congregation. All right, so Epaphroditus. That's, that's a big word. <laughs> when Paul's in prison, people at Philippi are sending a gift. They're sending support to Paul. Why was that important? Well, you remember when you're in prison, Rome's not going to take care of you. If you want food, your family has to bring you food. All right. Uh, if you want anything, somebody is going to have to bring that to you. All we're going to do is lock you up. So, you know, the church supported him while he's in prison. Uh, you think that's important? Yeah. Uh, if, if not somebody supporting him, he would have, he would have died. Uh, Philippians 4.18, if you want to look at that, uh, he says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice of acceptable and pleasing to God. He calls this gift an offering, a sacrifice. We're going to get into the sacrificial system one day. And, you know, if you study that, not every sacrifice is for sin. Fragrant offering, a sacrifice of incense, was just fellowship. God, I love you appreciate what you're doing, um, that sort of thing. Our, you know, but he says this payment was like that sacrifice. Uh, the prayers that we pray today, God is like a pleasing odor to God. Um, the sacrifices, of course, you, know, you have burning flesh. How does that smell? It smells bad. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been around burning flesh. I'm not much, uh, but I've talked to people that have, and man. But to us, it, it's bad. To God, that's a sweet savor. Why? Not so much that you're burning some critter, but what? It's, it's the heart that God enjoys. The heart that made that sacrifice is always the bottom line. Of course, we, we come back to that. Um, Philippians 4, 14 through 17, it was kind of you to share in my trouble, and yet you Philippians yourselves know the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia. No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He wants to see them growing in being able to give. 
And, you know, it's not the gift, he says. I want to see you grow being able to give. And it's always about, you know, the giver uh, and their heart. It's always it comes back to the heart. Uh, Paul wrote this epistle during a Paphroditus stay in Rome. Paphroditus brought the gift, and Paul writes the letter, and he sends the letter back with the Paphroditus, Philippians 2, 25 through 28. As Paul leaves Macedonia, the church at Philippi became a significant source of support. Uh, so, you know, that's why we're saying AD 60 to 62. Now, cultural references, uh, that's going to come up a lot. And he says, look in your Bible, Philippians 1, uh, 12 and 13. Uh, he's going to mention the praetorium. Now, I'm giving you fair warning. This is my chase the rabbit down the hole. Uh, <laughs> how many times do you get the fair warning? It usually just happens. I noticed it happened already a couple of times. So the word here is praetorium. Uh, that's the word in Greek. Well, look how it's used. The literal standard version, which is not the standard as far as I know. I've never really heard of it says praetorium, but the other translation, palace, praetorium guard, imperial guard, palace guard. It, usually, American standard, I want to know, you know, is the one I use if, if it's, I want to know literally what's the word, because it's so, so literal. And even American standard calls it praetorium guard. Well, he's using, that's a building. Uh, but if you look in that verse, he's talking about uh, the, the, the guards for the building. Well, uh, were you, oh, by the way, let me just show you this as an aside. In the old days, I would have had to look up all those different verses in different Bibles. Now you can go to BibleHub.com, and you put in a verse, and it'll just list all the different translations and you can see how it's translated. That's just a little help in case you ever want to do that. Uh, there's a website that will, it's just a ticket for that sort of thing. But that's a, a rabbit from the rabbit, you know, if you, if you want to look at it that way. So this is a metonymy. This is a figure of speech that Paul uses. We use stuff like this all the time. They say the White House announces this. The White House did that. Well, the White House is a building. It can't do anything. They're talking about the people in the White House. All right? Well, that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's talking about the whole praetorium there, the whole palace guard. So it might number up to several thousand uh, people that are assigned to that. A lot of them have been chained to Paul. Now, <laughs> you know in Paul as well as you do, if Paul's going to be chained to a guy, what's he going to do? He's going to talk to him about Jesus, isn't he? Talk about your captive audience. Who's the captive? Is it Paul or is it the guards? Well, <laughs> you know, you decide. But the whole guard knew that Paul's being imprisoned for Jesus. They knew about Jesus, and you know they're gonna. There's people in there that are obviously they've been converted, and he's gonna say, you know what? These people send you greetings. You know, <laughs> is it possible that Nero heard about Jesus through people in the palace? I don't know. It, you know, the possibilities kind of blow your mind. So. Anyway, a lot to think about, and that's a fun little rabbit hole. I love to go down to stuff like that. Does it matter? Well, no, not really. It's not salvation. Uh, look in uh, Philippians 2, 11 through 16. Uh, some people want to call that a hymn uh, just because of how it's written. I couldn't see it. I, 
read, read those verses. What did I say, 11 through 16? I should have said 6 through 11. Uh, just because how it's written. Uh, evidently, people that know how hymns, songs worked and during that time, uh, they said, ah, oh, well, that is in the form of a hymn. Um, we've talked a little bit about the prize. No, we haven't. The prize, uh, Philippians 3, 13, and 14, he says, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call. Now, of course, the winner of a Greek game, remember the early Olympic games, they had a wreath. Sometimes they won money. And that is a corruptible prize. He says, our prize is in heaven. Uncorrupted. You can't take that away. All right. You can take all my stuff, my house. You can take my life. I've still got this prize. And that's what we have uh, that can't be taken away. Uh, we've mentioned Philippians 4.18. Uh, this is a fragrant offering, referring back to sacrifices. Really, the pagans had uh, sacrifices as well, um, and so they would be familiar with this type reference. Uh, those that belong to Caesar's household, Philippians 4, 22, we've, we've kind of mentioned that. You, you think about the Caesars that Paul's had. You got Caligula, 37 to 41, Claudius, 41 to 54, Nero, 54 to 68 AD. Caligula, evil. Nero, evil. Claudius, he was a good ruler, but he had a physical impairment, and they didn't think he was a good ruler. Kind of how that worked. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we talk about bad presidents, we talk about bad politicians. Our guys can't hold a candle to these guys. Uh, these guys actively evil. Uh, it was all in on evil, how, however you want to say it. Um, you think about the gospel being all around Nero and the possibilities there. You know, did, it, did it do any good as far as he was concerned? I don't know. Uh, some things we may not ever know. Let's go on to themes, message, and key verse. And uh, most of this uh, I want to hit just very lightly because uh, Revolution had a good lesson last week. Uh, and then next week, uh, Brother Michael. Uh, so you think about, let's go on to the key verse. Uh, what would you call the, the key verse of this? Um, you know, the uh, joy part. I can't even find it. There it is. Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I, again, I will say rejoice. Uh, our look at the book material, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort, uses that section. My verse that I go back to again and again, Philippians 4.8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's the one I keep coming back to. Which one do you use? Which one do you think about the most? All right, Lord willing, next week, uh, Brother Michael will look at the text of Philippians. Thank you, guys.